The following presentation is a gift from the team at Streamline Publishing, publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plain Air Magazine, and weekly newsletters Fine Art Today, Realism Today, Plain Air Today, and American Watercolor, and events the Plain Air Convention and the Figurative Art Convention. We offer over 400 different art instruction tutorials and ultra high quality video by the world's leading artists. If you like what you see, help us support our artists and our team with your purchase. Each video aired has a special discount code for today only in the comments section with a link to the video offered. And to see everything we do, or if you want to receive notice of new releases, new products, and new events for artists, simply click the other link, which says, see everything we do. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes with Plein Air and Fine Art Connoisseur magazines. Every once in a while in my job, I stumble across people who are just the best at doing something almost better than anybody else, right? So I had an opportunity to spend time with Stephanie Birdsall. She is so good at still life painting, at floral painting. And I said, what do you love to paint? What do people most want to learn from you? She said, lemons. Everybody loves lemons. I said, well, great, let's do a video on that. So we're going to share a segment of Lemons and Leaves with you right now. Hi, I'm Stephanie Birdsall, and I'm going to paint lemons for you today and try and explain my concept, what I think about, how I process it. I brought lemons because lemons are more than just lemons for me. I actually brought these from Connecticut on the plane with me to Austin, and they symbolize a lot of things, and they've been a lot of my painting journey, so let's get started. To start with showing you how I prepare my canvases and also I don't have a set way of working my setups tell me what they want sometimes I start with a white canvas that I put a dark background on and sometimes I start with a dark one which I've pre-treated which is this and I want to start with showing you how I do this because I could use this or I could go the other direction but I love keeping these in the studio because they're a combination of transparent oxide red and usually viridian. And to me, they're the color of rich dark earth and almost everything I paint is organic. I paint from life and I like to think that things are growing out of the canvas at me like they would out of the ground. So I'll start with some transparent oxide red and I always try and clean my palette knife before I put it into another color. I'll put some Viridian in and try and make a rich, dark, rich earth background. I'm going to add a little more brown to it. I live in New England and we have this wonderful, dark, rich earth and things grow beautifully out of it. So. I'm going to take this and I'm, I'm using a hake brush because it's soft. And I'm going to put a little bit of my Terps, which is Gamsol, in it. And then I'm going to start tinting this canvas. Now, sometimes I use more transparent oxide red, sometimes more green, sometimes brown. Let's make this a little brighter. And it's thin. I may have made it a little too thin, so I'll put a little more paint on it. I'm going to make it just a little bit heavier. It's a little drippy right now. And I can put more on if, I, if, if there's too much on it. But what I like to do is take either a really soft old rag or a Viva. And I like the Vivas because they are soft. And then I just start to wipe it off. I want to get the top wet part of it off. I'm 
Now, I actually want to put a little more color on this one, so I'm going to wipe even more off, and I'll put some more on. Now, my underpainting, or my background, is generally keyed to what I'm painting. So if I'm painting something with a lot of white in it, I won't start with this much of a background. I'd go on with something lighter. Um, I might not use anything. I might just draw it in a little bit, but I want to go darker with this. So let's put some more on. And one thing I want to tell you is that I use Viridian, but I actually use what's called Holbein Viridian Hue. And I know Hue is usually considered a lesser paint, but I like it because it seems to have some phthalo green in it, so it's a little bit more intense. Now let's go with this. This is better. This is a little bit black, but if you look at the color of the background that I've got in here, it's dark and it has a it has some blue in it, so I'm looking at that thinking I want to be able to pull that into it so that I already start off with the dark. I see a brush here and there. Let me just fix it. This one is actually lighter than the other panel. In my studio, I have a number of these with different values. Some are darker than others. Again, some have more brown, some more green. And so I'm kind of ready to go once I get my subject. Plus, I love the way they look before you paint them like this. I posted one on Facebook because it looked like just a wonderful, rich, soft abstract. So I'm going to let this set up for a second, and then I'll decide which I want to use. I want to talk to you about my still life. I can take hours to set one up. Um, I also I use natural light normally. We've tried to come up with a soft light in the studio to approximate what I would be painting with at home. I like a north light. And the lemons, let me tell you the story of those. When I lived in Tucson, I was given a Meyer lemon tree by my landscaper. And I'd never had a lemon tree. So I started with, oh my god, I'm so excited, lemons, because I'd never had a tree. So I went outside and I painted from life. This was plein air. And I painted a couple of those, and it got really, really hot. So I started to take branches inside. And the tree was very, very prolific, so I had a lot of opportunities. But what I found happening is I started out painting lemons. And once I got them inside, it became more about the shapes of them because I started to notice that every lemon has a different shape, no two are alike. 
And then it became about the color. It became, oh my God, there's so many different color yellows. Wow, this one's got orange, this one's got green. Uh, there's a little bit of a lavender glow on this. And so I really started getting into yellow and shapes. And then it was, oh my God, leaves. Look at these leaves. Look at the shapes of the leaves. No two leaves are the same. So then it became about the flow of the leaves. And I actually took a year off to learn to paint leaves because my leaves weren't great. And they were so important to what I was painting. They described the way the light's hitting them and flowing. Again, there were so many different greens. And so it, it really became a study in color and in shapes. And I, one day I realized I was no longer painting lemons. I was painting yellow shapes, green shapes, pieces of yellow. Uh, what's the yellow look like reflected on the white? And I got beyond lemons. And it's been life changing for me because now when I approach a setup, I might go, oh my God, I'm so excited, I can't wait to paint it. But it's not about the rose or the lemons. It's about the pieces that I see that make the painting. So my advice is if you find something like I found in lemons that you like to paint, paint a thousand of them. Paint them and paint them and paint them till you stop seeing them as objects with names and they just become shapes and color. And then you start to see the way they fit into your canvas. I mean, it, it's, it just, it was really earth shattering for me. So let's take a look at my setup. Um, I'm trying to approximate one light source, which would be coming left to right because I think your eyes naturally read from left to right. So I've set up what I hope is a flow that's going to move from here back around, come through here, come forward, and go back. I'm using this background that has the green in it. Again, I feel it's more organic. And when I set it up, I looked for areas that my edges could fade off into the background. So I want some dark on dark areas like back in here. If you can see the shadow sides where things are going backwards into the dark and where I have some light entering here. And I'll move this tube when I go to paint it. I use these flower tubes, which you can get at your florist, because when you work with pieces like branches, they'll wilt if you don't have them in the water. The same with flowers. So I travel with these tubes and buy a hundred at a time. And I'll move this because I already know that I want my light to come up here and enter this lemon and make some softness in that. So I want my light to travel and I want my dark to fade off. So in trying to set this up, I'm looking for where are my edges? And I don't know if you're familiar with squinting, but you'll see me squinting a lot because when I squint, it simplifies it. And if I'm looking at abstract shapes and colors, then I want to really simplify it down. I can always bring more detail into it, but I would rather start with less than choose where I want it, what edges I want to bring out. And for instance, you can see this edge, this light against that dark. I'll use that to pull that leaf forward or this. I'm not sure I'm happy with the placement of this one, but I like the way it's catching the light. So I want definite surfaces to catch light and then I want some of my surfaces to slide into the shadow or for the light to slide down it. And then it's just, I'm probably at a slightly different angle for the moment than you are because I'm here and the camera's not, but you will see it. So what else can I tell you? I'll be moving this a little bit, probably all the way through. The leaves will drop a little bit and, you know, sometimes I get into something and I realize, whoa, those lemons are on exactly the same plane. So I'll push one back a little, pull another one forward, um, or maybe I have two leaves that are too much the same. I want to show you something though. So what I want to show you is this leaf. And one of the things I notice is people will often make just a symmetrical shape. And it's not. 
each leaf is actually different. So when you go to paint your leaves, I can't even do it. You don't want to do this. You want to take a look at the actual shape of your leaves, and it makes your paintings more interesting. But this leaf actually has two different sides. Hopefully you can see it but that my hands aren't in the way, but it's a different shape on this side from that side. It's narrower here, it's wider here, it curves up, comes out. This one is wider on this side, and they, they enter the bottom. Actually, this side is actually lower than that. I don't know if you can see it. The other things is leaves are like trees. This would be your trunk, and these are the branches. So if you think about that, and you think about a tree, trees grow in different shapes. They branch out differently, and there's a reason that leaves have the shapes that they do. So I'd like you to be conscious of that, at least I'm conscious of it, whenever I'm painting them. So when I'm looking at my setup, things like this are meaningful to me. You can see how this leaf comes in, curves around. This one seems to have a different shape definitely on that side. So I want to be conscious of all of that when I'm painting them. I just don't want to put in a symmetrical shape and call it a leaf. So when I'm looking, I'm looking at all these shapes. Um, you know, this is one I'm not sure about right now. I think it will probably move. I definitely want the light on it, but I, I don't know if I'm completely happy with that. I will play with this probably throughout the still life, but they tend to fall. Sometimes they, they relax and end up with something much better. And I find that flowers when I'm painting them end up turning one way or the other. And so often it's even better than when I started. So let's start this. The other thing I just want to say real quick is when I set up a painting, I have a concept before I start. It could be about light, it could be about color, it could be value, and yes, all paintings have some of that in it. But for me, very often, because of, I have a north-facing fa north window, it's about how the light falls, and I love watching the light fall across it. We'll see what happens in here, but when I squint down at this, there's a lot of dark in it. So I asked myself, this is part of how I make a decision of how I want to start my painting. It's hard because I, I, like I like them both. It could go either way. I don't have a set formula. I let each setup speak to me. I also have to figure out, I do this a lot, to figure out exactly where I want it on my canvas. This also tells me, you know, if I've got something that isn't going to be in the right place, um, every single inch of your canvas is important. So when I look at this, I'm looking at, am I going to have a nice shape in this corner? Am I going to have a pretty shape coming down here? Is this going to lead your eye into the canvas, my subject, or away from it? And these sides are important when you're planning your painting. So often I see students come in and they've done a beautiful painting but it's in the wrong place. So I like to do, and I'll do it now, a little sketch, or not really a sketch, I'll show you how I'm thinking through this and where I want things to go. And I guess we'll just use this one. Okay, this, this is a panel that I made today, the wet one. And I go through this so often when I start a painting because I love working both ways. And they're both great. I just, sometimes I like to wipe out and sometimes I like to use the dark dry canvas because the paint goes on differently. And I actually think I'm gonna go ahead and use the canvas that I brought in today that's already stained the dark earth color because I find so much dark in this background and the shadows melting into it, so I'm going to switch out canvases. Now before I start, 
I'm going to make a few convenience colors. Convenience colors are colors that are more of a middle value. If I have something like this and I know I'm going to have whites in it or lighter colors, I like to have some lighter piles to mix from. So I'm going to start with an ultramarine blue and white mixture. And I'm going to go for a, a sort of a middle value blue so that if I want to, instead of adding white to everything every time, I know that I've already got this nice mid blue and I can build on that. Then my next one is going to be a lizard crimson and the ultramarine and white. So now I have a purple shade or a lavender that is again going to be more of a mid value. And there are different combinations you can use. Sometimes I use cobalt blue pale and permanent rose. And then I'm also going to make, I use titanium white and a lizard crimson. Okay, I also like to make a middle value pretty green. So I'm going to use ultramarine blue, which is ultramarine blue deep. And I'm going to use cad yellow to start with, and we'll see what happens. So that looks like a nice green. Clean this off and put out a little more transparent oxide red. Okay, so let me tell you what my palette is. This, okay, all my paints are Holbein except for my transparent colors, which are Rembrandt. The reason I like the Holbeins is that they are a thicker, dense paint and I actually flew back from Europe one time and left the paints on my palette. Don't ask me why I didn't clean, but I didn't. Um, they stayed. They went through customs, they went transatlantic flight, and they didn't move. So for me, because of the amount of hiking and packing I do with my paints, I like to do that. I can always thin them down, and I have some walnut oil here, which I might use with a little Gamsol in it if I want to do some glazing or thin out my paints. A lot of times I just use a little bit of Gamsol with my paints. But so we have permanent green light, viridian hue, sap green, ultramarine blue deep, cobalt blue light, titanium white, a cadmium lemon, a cad lemon light, cadmium yellow, Cadmium Yellow Deep, those are all Holbeins. This is something called Still de Grain Yellow, and it's a Rembrandt. It's very transparent. Yellow Ochre Pale Natural, Cadmium Orange, Cadmium Red, Terra Rosa. These three are Rembrandts. They are Transparent Oxide Yellow, Transparent Oxide Red, Transparent Oxide Brown. This is Windsor Newton Permanent Rose, and this is Holbein Alizarin Crimson. This is my basic palette, and if you're familiar with Richard Schmid's A La Prima, I use the color charts. I've made them, and I use the color charts religiously. The principle is that is each chart is predominantly one of the colors on your palette, so potentially it could be cadmium yellow deep. And then you have five levels of values, and it will be the cad yellow deep mixed with each of these. The 12 basics wouldn't include the permanent green light or the sap green or the rose or the transparent oxide brown or transparent oxide yellow or still the grain. But what I do when I get a new color is I'll take that new color and I'll make a chart and mix it with all of the other colors so that I know what to expect. And I feel like the more I know what my colors are going to do, the easier it is for me to paint 
and the easier it is to maintain clean colors because hopefully I'm only mixing two colors plus white or sometimes I may tint it with something else but it's been it's been another one of those earth-shattering experiences. It's so worth it. It takes two weeks, but it's worth it. So let's get started. And this, this is the scariest and kind of the most fun time because I'm excited about what I'm gonna paint. It's a little scared of it, but um, it's so wonderful to have a blank canvas and all this in front of me, and then it's gonna be whatever I want it to be. I tell my students that, because I say this to myself. When I, st I, I don't stand by back and say the painting's not working. The reason I do that is because it's not the painting's fault. It's my fault. And so if it's not working on here, it's something that I've done that's not working. So I ask myself questions that I call paint speak, which are understandable terms like edges, values, shapes, drawing. So if something isn't working, and you'll hear me do this, I'll, I'll ask myself, what isn't working? And then I can say, well, gosh, edges, or hmm, didn't quite get that color, or this color needs more green, or needs more something. When I can clearly ask myself what's going on in here, then I have a way to get back into it. So rather than going, oh, it's not working, I go, oh yeah, it needs that edge. So I talk to myself all the time. But that's how I approach this. And then I actually think this is very much about color. I've used some older Meyer lemons, which I brought from Connecticut, and I actually picked up a few regular lemons because if you notice, the lemon on the far right definitely has a greenish cast. The one in the front seems to have more cad yellow light in it. As I move through, the older Meyer lemons has a little more of a cad yellow deep in it. And so I'm looking around and actually the far lemon on the left seems to have almost a red to the bottom of it. So this is really gonna be about the differences in yellow combined with the light that's affecting it, and of course the gracefulness of the leaves. But so if I'm thinking color on this and I really wanna get the color of those. So I'm gonna start with just a little outline for myself. I wanna lay this out on the canvas somewhat and I'll start with my lemons here, there's a graceful line coming through here. This looks to be about there. I have, if this is going here, it's coming around here. This is gonna come there. What I do for myself is I try and set up something that speaks to me very simply. The reason I do this is that if I don't like this at this point, all I have to do is wipe it off, which we'll do real quick so you can see and we'll do it again. I haven't lost anything. I am a pacer. I walk back 20 feet, I come up 20 feet. So in my studio, I would walk back. I would take a look at it. I would decide if I like where it is on the canvas, how it's relating to the edges. Is it too high, is it too low? There's nothing worse than painting a painting, and it's a great painting, and suddenly you realize, oh my God, it's too close to the edge of the canvas, or it's too high up, or it's falling out the side. And so I like to give myself as much right in the beginning as possible so that I don't get in and spend all my time and energy painting something that would have been beautiful if I'd put it in the right place. So the other thing is I try and paint a little smaller than what I've got. And the reason is that as we paint, things seem to grow. You know, you start out with an apple this big and suddenly it's this big on your canvas and you wonder how it got there. So if you start out a little smaller and you grow, it's gonna be okay. So let's go back in. This also lets me decide my placement. Do I want it high, do I want it low? This is sort of going all over. So let's go back to I might even raise it a little this time. 
And remember, I'm also thinking, what's my shape and what's my lead in from the corner? But I have to leave room for the leaves on the top. So these are here. This is going to be about here. This also gives me a chance to analyze if any of my lemons are all on the same plane or I'm going to have a, I don't want a line straight across here. I don't want, you know, I don't want two on the same place, plane down here. So this is all part of organizing the still life. But again, I want to do it at a time where I don't have so much invested that I can't change it. This is coming up here, up there. Now I'll tell you something I just noticed. I do this all through. In putting this one up here, which is the top leaf catching the light, I realize I've almost got it centered in the canvas. So now before I paint it anymore, instead of painting it in, I just wipe it out and it tells me that I need to move these over. Because when I actually look at this, it seems to be more of about there. which means I have to move this too. But I don't mind doing this because I'd rather get it right before I really get into it than have to come back and keep fixing things. This is coming down. What's my relationship from here to here? I ask myself all the time, what's my relationship between these, these objects? And I'll tell you a story that my students all have to hear. But early on when I was painting, when I started still lifes, and really the heat in Tucson chased me indoors. I never thought I'd do anything but paint out. Um, I painted two apples on a white cloth. And when I finished, I had to title it. And I looked at them, and they just looked like they were in love. So I called it happily married. So now, when I'm setting these up, I'm thinking, well, each of these lemons is talking to each other. Um, you know, I definitely have a conversation going on with the two in the middle, the most yellow on the front left, and the Meyer lemon. They're talking. I mean, this could be a family. It might sound a little crazy, but it helps me set up my still life. They all have to relate to each other. I, you know, I love, I think of natural still lifes, and I like to sort of throw things out there to some extent and see where they fall. But once they do that, I have to look at how is this going to relate to that? How is this going to relate to that? And, and that helps me with my setup. Does this need to be higher? Does this need to be over more? Again, I'm at a stage where I can take things out and make corrections before I get into it and realize that they're in the wrong place. And that doesn't mean I never put them in the wrong place, but I just want to start out with as much going for me as possible. Here's a dark. And if that's dark there, this comes up here. This is coming more over here. What's the relationship from this lemon, which I still need to move, move over to this lemon? It's going here. Another dark in here. And I'll be making corrections because as, even after, as I've set this up, I can see the leaves doing some moving. I know it may not look much like much right now, but in my mind, I'm still organizing this whole canvas. This is here. So what's the shape from here to there to there to there? That's really important to me. How are my shapes relating to each other? So I'm not really drawing. I sort of like to feel like I'm walking across the canvas. What's this to this? This goes from here to here. A 
This is coming out, this comes around. And we will move the tube that's in front of this when we get a little farther into it. I just don't want to take my lemons out of the tubes yet. They've come a long way. So I stand back and I just ask myself, is this going to work? Is it too high? Is it too low? This one needs to come down a little here. I'm going to have a dark coming in here. There's going to be an angle coming in here. I'm going to start putting some darks in. So I have to really sort out the shape that's in here right now because there's a completely lost edge in here that comes up like that. Goes that way. I'm also going to put color notes in because especially when I work, if I had wiped this out, then I would have light areas that were telling me where the lemons are, but because we're working this way, I want to put some color in. And I feel like I'm pulling it out of the canvas. I mean, I joke about Michelangelo and the slaves, but I feel like the paint's being pulled out. Again, I'm not going to put the whole lemon in because right now I just want to make sure that my composition's working and that I'm happy with it. So. And I am the queen of wiping things out and taking them off. I am not attached to anything that's on here. If it's not right, it's going to go. One of the things I absolutely remember, in fact, the first thing I think I really ever got out of Alla Prima was never knowingly leave anything wrong on your canvas. I, if you're not familiar with the book Alla Prima by Richard Schmidt, it's my Bible. It travels everywhere with me. I read it on the planes. It's in my studio. The very first thing that I think really caught me, aside from all the basic things about edges and, but as the philosophy was, Richard says, never knowingly leave anything wrong on your canvas. I must have had that taped to my easel for my first five years of painting. And, it, and it, it's, it's really been freeing in a way because I really try and pay attention to it. And if it's not right, I'll absolutely take it off my canvas. I'm like, I, my students teach me, tease me I'm the queen of wiping out. I'll take it off. I'm not attached to any of this. If it's not right, I don't want it on here because I'm going to spend my life fixing it. I'd rather take more time at the beginning getting it right than go through why didn't I take it out and spend forever trying to paint it. So these color notes give me an idea Still on composition. Is it going to be right? So you have a little play of color going on in here. The other thing I like to do is seat my leavens to some extent. Like I know there's an absence of light on this side, so I want to throw a darker value in here. I sometimes also lift paint off with a wet brush. I don't want that dark in there. Okay. 
And I'm going to just put a note of light in here for a minute. I'm always asking myself, what color is it? What color is it? What does it need? Does it need? Does it need red? Does it need yellow? Does it need blue? Green? This is helping me sort through the craziness that the leaves can be. And all the, there's so many little shapes up here. I want to compare these two to each other. This canvas, which happens to be the Raymar L64, is very smooth. I like it because it grabs just enough of the paint, but you'll see everything goes on a little bit transparently to start with, which I like. And this is ultimately going to be a lost edge, so we'll just kind of get rid of it. So now I want to walk around this one. I'm going to put a piece, a couple of pieces of green in. I try to, ch okay, if I'm plein air painting and I want to go out with limited brushes, I really work hard at trying to keep my brushes separate, so I'm probably not as good in the studio, but if you want to travel light, then I'll try and keep one brush that's maybe more green, one that's more yellows, a red brush. You can really do, you can really get a lot out of your brushes if you keep your colors separate. I also try and clean my brushes constantly. So I need a darker, dark holds the light. So what I want to do here is get in, whoops, that's not dark enough. Get in my dark part of this lemon in the front here. And let it hold the light shape, which it will. Also, you want to think about what's more important, the lights that you're working with or your darks. And your darks, to me, are almost always more simple. Unless I was painting a painting that was about very dark objects and, and with only a little bit of light, that would change. But in something like this that has as much light in it, my emphasis is going to be 
on what's in the light. That's going to be what captures my eye. I also like to paint color next to color, so if I put something on, very often I try to go and put what's next to it on. So for instance here, I know I've got a piece of light on the table that's reflecting that yellow. So I want to put that in under here. In the meantime, I'm going to take off this dark. Because it already told me what I needed to know, so I don't need it in my, now in my setup, but I know this light is going to come into there and vice versa, so I'm just going to make a note with it. It's also looking kind of the same in here. There's some orange reflection in it, so put a little orange in, and while we're at it, soften this edge. I'm addicted to rosemary brushes. These are long flat ivories, which I do most of my painting with. This is the uh, Series 279. It's a really soft brush and it's wonderful for just softening edges. It also will get a point, which I'll show you later for making stems. But I have a mixture of so many. I've got evergreens, I've got uh, the extra long filberts. I've got some of the Mundy brushes. I just, I love these brushes. I don't think a girl can have too many brushes or too many paints. It's not diamonds, it's painting equipment. I'm just making some little corrections in light as I see them. looking for a little darker, warmer green. I can't tell you right now if it's enough, but I'm going to try it. So when I squint down, I've got a nice dark area here, which will probably end up going darker, but I just want to get a little more on here of a dark shape. I don't know if you can see, but I'm sort of building a little circle of color so that I can relate these all and then make sure they're right or they're where I want them because I can still correct it at this point. I've only got so much on my canvas right now, and this would be easy to wipe the whole thing off and start over if I want to. So I see what I want, but I'm just I'm checking myself to make sure I'm getting it before continuing. And I do tend to paint by pieces of color. So I look at this and I'll break it down more. Sometimes they're smaller, sometimes they might be bigger, but I'm just, my brain is organizing what I'm seeing as I'm doing this. So I have to check this level and this level and that one and just make sure it's close. I could at this point, if, if you can see my setup, the far Meyer lemon, which is the oranger lemon, 
is very close in height to the lemon that's directly across from it. If I tilt my head, I can see the difference, but I, this, these are areas I really have to watch. And these are times that I will get into moving my still life just a little bit so that I don't have a complete, you know, I don't have a flat angle going across. And I was conscious of that when I set it up, but you know, things you don't really know sometimes to actually get into the painting, so I'm not adverse to moving things. There was a point in time where I thought, God, if I don't have it set up perfectly, I can't get started. But now I feel like if I'm close enough, if I have to tweak just a little bit, I obviously do want it right before I start, but again, if you're painting with living things, they move flowers more so than lemons, but leaves, they have a mind of their own. So I'm gonna put this in, so it is a little bit lower. Oh, and I can see where it comes, like right out here to there. So actually, just by looking at the relationship of it to this, it helps me construct, let me take that off. It helps me start to construct this shape. It's dark. But looking at this piece of the dark in here helps me do the drawing. What, what shape is that dark? And I'm going to take my brush and I'm going to scrape a little more of that off. Then I'll use this. So if I do that, I've now got to put in a piece of the dark next to it, and I ask myself what color it is. One of the things I've learned is that as soon as you put one color next to the other color, it changes it, or certainly affects it. So that's why I like to put two together. I know this one's isolated right now, but the tube's there. I know it's going to have a light that's going to reflect up on it. But so now that I've got this in, I kind of have to ask myself, okay, what color is this shadow? I know that these are cool lights, so it's going to be warm, but because of the darkness and the blue-green of the drape, it has a lot of green reflecting into it, so I have to think about what color it is. If I had my color charts right now, I'd hold a chart up and I'd go, is it this or this or this? I'm going to try a little Viridian and Terra Rosa. I'm not sure, but that might be it. If it's not right, I just do it again. Again, I, I don't care how long it takes me to get it right. I just ultimately want to get it right. So if I have to mix, take out, keep going, I'm fine with it. Now in looking at this color, well, let's put a piece up. It looks too cold on here. I'm going to throw in just a little bit of transparent, actually this is still the grain yellow, and warm it up just a bit. And I want to check my values. That's probably too light, but I want to get something next to it. This is where this background comes in. It's literally the same value. So having all this dark around it, it's just, it helps me get there faster. I know that that is essentially the same value as the board I'm using. So let's move on. I'm going to go in with a little green here.
Now I'm going to take some of this off because I think that initial stroke was too big. And let's get a real dark back behind it. Sometimes it's, you know, I try and put in the lightest and the darkest first in values and color or the brightest. These are all fairly bright, but I, I just, I need to tell myself that that and this area over here are going to be potentially my darkest. But I need to know what I'm doing value-wise. I think that's too light, but let me just try getting a dark in here. I think I really just make notes the entire time I'm painting, and then when I get them on, I can sit back and you know, ask myself if it's right, if it's working, and, and where do I want to adjust it. I have to just stand back a minute and look. Okay, immediately I can see that my values are off. I've got that yellow shape or lemon on the left too light. So I can sc scrape some of the paint off. Or just go on top of it with something a little darker. I'm going to add a little yellow ochre to this. That's better. Remember, we're still, we're actually still kind of in a setup stage. This needs to come down. There's a piece of light coming in here. I know I'm picking up a little color underneath, but I'm not worried about it.
because I can take it out if I need to. But it's almost, it's, I'm almost using it like a tint right now. I'm going to have a wonderful leaf coming down here. dark in here. This is going to, this edge is going to lead me into the next lemon that's back there. So I'm just trying to connect them all. Yellow shape. definitely dark and it's a dark that's being joined to the leaf below to the uh, the leaf below it so there's a dark shape in here probably darker than that And I need to clean my palette after I do this. Better, but I actually want to get that lighter purple off.
I'd like to put the stems in or at least notate them somewhere at the beginning because they're important to your eye and the flow of how your eye moves through the painting. I don't have a lot in this one. I really can't see very many of them, but it, it helps me. Dark in here. Need a bigger brush. This is thin, what I'm doing right now. I'm, I like to keep it transparent when I can. Then in a minute, I have to stand back and look at this again. I just want to put a little piece of color over here. Where is the, I think this has got to come up now. I noticed that when I stood back last time. Too light. I'm always saying to myself, too light, too dark, more yellow, more red, more green. That's better. When I stand back, I can see the corrections I need. So I ask myself, what is it that I want to do when I look at what's in here and I look at what's up there? What is it that I want to change or alter? You know, sometimes we get so into the painting that I feel like we almost forget to look at what we're doing. And that's, that's why I like to just move things with my brush. I cut in a lot or take things off. Also, when you get back, you just get much more of an overview. Like when I stood back, this seemed to be too far down in the front, so I'm going to move it up. How do I get from here to here to there? I'm going to move it up.
and I just about have to clean my palette. Half the fun is just being able to put the paint on. So, at least at this point, I can stand back, look at it again, diagnose it again. I actually, though, before I do anything, I really want to get some more dark value on the top here because I know that this is going to go right into it, so I want to get some on here. Thinly, because I may want to go over it, but I just want to get some dark shapes in. And I know also that there's a nice dark shadow from the curtain that's going to come in this way with the drape. and. be a directional for your eye. There's a little bit of a glare here, so I'm sort of having to come across some of my strokes to just keep it so I can see it. And I want to keep it kind of quiet for now, so I'm just going to simplify it till I know exactly what I want to have go on back there. The finest homes and the best museums are filled with still life paintings. No matter what inspires you to paint, the still life is a great way to grow as a painter by gathering interesting items or fruits or plants to paint from life. Not only does painting a still life help you master light, perspective and color in a whole new way, the more you do it, the more you'll be able to understand the world around you. With master artist Stephanie Birdsall, 
Learning to paint great still lifes is a shortcut to becoming a fearless painter. Now, in this all-new video course, she will show you how to create a stunning still life painting, from setting up the scene to make a beautiful composition, to making the final brushstrokes, all using one of her favorite subjects, the lemon. Hi, I'm Stephanie Birdsall. I've just finished filming a new instructional DVD. My subject matter is lemons and leaves because I love lemons and leaves. Then I'll walk you through my process of setting up, how I tweak my still life, the problems I run into, the thoughts I have, how I paint, how I walk my way through my painting, and I look forward to sharing it with you. It's been a great experience. In Lemons and Leaves, The Natural Still Life, you'll discover why it's important to create a happy marriage between the objects in your painting and how to make it happen. The steps for figuring out what's wrong when your painting feels off and what to do when you figure it out. Plus, how to create a painting that feels rich and museum quality, something few painters have ever figured out on their own. This master course in painting gives you almost eight hours of in-depth training that you can return to time and time again. Stephanie Birdsall is in demand by both collectors and serious students alike. And in this training, she'll teach you the exact techniques you can begin using today to paint your own stunning still life compositions. Lemons and Leaves, The Natural Still Life with Stephanie Birdsall is now available on DVD and streaming video. That was Stephanie Birdsall, and the video is Lemons and Leaves, and you can learn more about it at lilyartvideo.com. Now let's learn more about Stephanie. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes from Fine Art Connoisseur and Plein Air Magazine, and today we have Stephanie Birdsall with us. Stephanie, welcome. Thank you, Eric. So excited to hear about your career and your background and how you became such a magnificent painter. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> it's great to hear. Well, I got paid to say it. That's not fair. Okay. So um, let's start when you were a wee little thing. What happened? How did you become a painter? What, what were the influences that made you decide you wanted to take up art? I just always knew I was going to be an artist of some sort, whether it was writing, music, or painting. And um, painting went out. I was one of those kids that sketched, that drew. In high school, I was the best in the class, you know. I just loved it. You can't help it. So did you have natural talent? There's, I think talent's questionable. I think that, you know, you hear that it's 90% work and 10% talent, or 80% work and 20% talent, whatever. I think there's a drive that someone has that wants to be an artist, and it sort of bubbles up inside of you, and it propels you. And even when people put it away in my teaching, I very often get people that have raised families or had careers and they're getting back to it. They always had that sense inside yeah. that they wanted to be an artist. So I don't think you can get rid of it very easily. I think it kind of comes around. Well, you know, there's this great debate. And uh, I often find that when I'm out painting, somebody will walk up and they'll say, you know, I, uh, I wish I could do that, but I don't have any talent. And I always try to stop them and say, it's not about talent, it's about process. Yeah. You know, if, if you're willing to take the time to learn it and study it, there's something about art. We have this sense that, you know, somebody has to go to medical school to learn how to do surgery or to become a lawyer, or they have to go to cooking school to learn how to become a professional chef, or, you know, we, everything we do, we have to learn, but there's this belief, this mystery that art is something that just magically happens and it's not about learning, it's not about a process, it's just that people have talent. I think people do think it's magic. Yeah. And well, we want them to think that. Of course we do. <laughs> well, it is magic. But I think that, um, 
I think it's work, it's training, it's learning. I, you can't just do something without being taught it or studying it, whether it's from books, videos, an actual teacher, a school. There are ways to do everything that are more correct, faster, easier. You shortcut your mistakes. So I don't think it's talent. I think, I think it's desire more than talent. I think desire is a better word. And when you desire to know something, then you want to learn it. Yeah, you're passionate about following it up, reading. I, I, I don't know about you, but um, I'm still, I've been painting for 20 years, and I'm still reading every book I can get my hands on and watching every video and attending workshops and working with people because I, I want to get better. I hate to tell you, Eric, but I look at the pictures. <laughs> I do. I know that sounds funny. I do read it, but I have so many books when I'm painting because I want to see how somebody did it. So I have all these things for inspiration, and when I want to know how to paint white, I go look at Sargent. Right. You know, I'm not necessarily reading it, but boy, do I have great picture books. Yeah. Well, that's what it's all about. Let's talk about copying the masters. Did you ever do that? I did. Tell me about that. It wasn't exactly a copy, but when I went to art school in London, um, your senior year, your last year there, they take you into the National Gallery and you get to choose a painting or they give you a list of paintings and you can pick one of those and copy it. And for whatever reason, I was fascinated by Van Eyck's Marriage of Arnolfini, which is the guy in the fur hat and Van Eyck's in the back of the mirror and the gal is in this green dress and she looks pregnant and there's a little dog. Anyway, the painting is, I think it's 22 inches by 33 inches. So I went in, did some color studies, went back to my school, and did a five foot by eight foot. So that wasn't exactly a copy. <laughs> but um, but yes, yeah, studying the masters. I, Richard has said to me. Richard. Schmid. Um, he's told us to copy his, to learn how he did it. Uh, you see people in museums all the time. I, there's so many things I would like to go into a museum now and be able to copy. I'd love to go to the Hispanic Society and copy Soroya. Or, or go into the Met and copy a sergeant. I mean, it, just not even necessarily the whole painting, but parts of it that attract me. Mm -hmm. You know, now I find when I look at things, I might be looking at the whole painting, but very often I'm looking at something specific. Um, Rembrandt, the way there's a, a collar. I think it's in the Met that he did that just it's so, the paint is so unbelievable you think it's lace but it's actually it's it's the way the paints put on the thickness of it and it is lace but it's just I'd like to go copy that part of the painting mm -hmm. you know they're just now I mean maybe there's a hand hand in a painting or fabric you know I'd like to copy some of Sargent's dresses you know those big bold strokes it is I'd like to be able to do that Richard, not a bad person to copy. I mean, it just it's a great way to learn because when I have done it, and I have done it with different things, not museums, sometimes it's out of a book or something, but when I try and understand how they did it, even to make their colors, it's a whole new learning experience. So I think it's great and a great way to learn. So do you, um, when you teach workshops or when you're teaching in general, do you recommend your students go copy, or is there a point at which it's too early to do that? I don't think it's ever too early. I think when you're just getting started, it could be very frustrating. Pretty overwhelming. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I did in art school was, um, you know, I, I was in the late 70s in art school in London, and so the Impressionists were very big at that time. And so we studied them, but then we did a painting in the manner of. And I actually recently on Facebook had someone ask me if I would mind if they copied my painting. And my first reaction was, and I'll tell you a funny story, I'd rather you did one, study my painting, and then do one in the style of it. But I will tell you a funny story. Okay. I recently was teaching in Scottsdale, and a gal brought out her iPad, because I want, sometimes, you know, if I can, I like to see students work, because then I can tell what is it they need and where I can help them, and I'm there for them, but they're not there for me. Right. I am their servant when I'm teaching them. Anyway, I'm, I'm 
going through her iPad and suddenly I see this painting and I go, did you ever go to Baojima? She goes, what? She said, oh, I copied that out of Southwest Art. It was my painting. <laughs> she had no idea. But she liked the painting and so it, she had done her own copy of it and I, she said I never sold it or anything but but it was so funny to go through her iPad and suddenly I mean I, I knew it wasn't my painting but it was definitely the scene and I had done the scene from life right so it was interesting but hopefully she got something out of it well let's talk about that because I think that's a big issue uh, because I hear from gallery owners all the time that they see artists knocking off other artists work and trying to pass it off as their own um, obviously, we believe that's wrong. Of course. But it's wrong on a lot of levels. What, what are your feelings as an artist about that? You know, I think if you're studying with someone and they give you permission to copy something they've done or think it will help the, help the student in some way, that's a completely different relationship. I recently um, got notified that somebody in China was reproducing my work. So I wrote them and said, you do not have my permission to do this. And so they wrote back. They gave me this blurb about how it was, how it was promoting me and all this stuff. And I just said, no, I don't think so. But I went online and there are my paintings for sale. I, whether, I don't know the originals or prints, but they were doing something with it. Then they said they would take my name off. I haven't gone back and checked it, but that happens a lot. I don't think it's fair, and I don't think it's right. I understand, you know, when we went into the National Gallery in London, we had the permission of the museum to be in there, to do it. One thing, and I, and I know this just from being in museums, if you do a, quote, copy, it has to be a different size from the original. Yeah. So there's no mistake. In your case, Mine five, was a different five size. <laughs> I want it to be life-size, yeah. but you know, that's what you're like in your 20s. You want everything big, right. but um, I think it's wrong. I, I think, I honestly don't know why it happens, and I, I think there are painters that learn to paint in the style of someone else, but they don't grow on their own as a painter, and you can look, you can look at who studied with who, and if they're using a part of it or if they never grew any, or did anything further. Well, I, I, I have been to places, I've flipped through magazines, I've been in galleries, I've taken pictures of paintings, and there have been times when I'd like to have that painting hanging in my house. But it's one thing for me to make a copy of it and pass it off as my own, it's another thing to put a signature on it that has my signature that says, after Stephanie Birdsall or inspired by, so that you're getting credit rather, but I think the big issue is that a lot of people are trying to pass it off as their own. Now, I, I am curious though, because um, there is this style copying trend that's going on. And it's flattering in, in one hand, and yet it's copying in another hand. So if it's, let's say Richard Schmid, who you're good friends with, um, if Richard breeds 5,000 or 10,000 or 100,000 copycat Richard Schmid painters, doesn't that hurt his work ultimately, especially if somebody comes, becomes very proficient at it? Or is the intent, pick up some of what I've taught you so you can learn some technique but develop a style of your own? First of all, nobody can paint like Richard. Of so course that's a point. <laughs> no. You know, with Richard, I think Richard is inspirational and informative. I can learn. You can learn from studying his work or watching his DVDs and understand how he does it. I think the great thing about DVDs or videos or watching someone paint is understanding how they're getting where they're going. And I think we all take a little bit from everyone we study with. And then I have to go back to the crux of that is really understanding it. To understand how someone creates something or does something isn't necessarily to paint in their style. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that there might be something that you're taking from it and using it because it works for you, but I think there's a fine line. 
and really great painters don't paint like anyone else. Right. They've taken the information and they've owned it and they put it back out. Mm -hmm. And there's schools of thought, you know, there's, there's the school of Rembrandt, there are contemporary realists that are out there, there's Bougereau, there's, there's Richard, there's the Impressionists. You can understand their thought processes and learn from it, but it doesn't mean you're going to do exactly what they did because the nature of being individual is that all our paintings are. I mean, I, no matter what, maybe it's just me, I could not paint a Richard. I'm not saying other people couldn't, but I think in, the, in growing as a true artist, you're still searching. You're not going to paint a Richard. You're going to paint a whoever, an, an Eric. But ideally, you understand how he got to where he got. You, you don't want them painting an Eric. Well, no, I want you to paint Eric. <laughs> yeah, okay. I can do that. But understanding how someone thinks and how they use their materials, there's so much value in that. So you and I were talking before the interview about application of paint, and you mentioned to me that one of the big problems that you find consistently with students is that they've not been taught how to apply paint. Do you want to articulate true. that a little bit for everybody? You know, I um, started in Vermont when I was teaching there, but my workshops have been affectionately nicknamed boot camps. Because I'm really lucky I have been able to teach an amazing number of wonderful people that really want to learn. And half the time I find the biggest problem is no one ever explained how to do something. No one ever explained how to make a brush stroke, how to mix paint, how to use a palette knife, why you paint thin, why you paint thickly, um, mediums, e even transporting canvases or it's what kind of canvas to use. It's incredible how many people can become better painters by just understanding their materials. And to me, paint application is huge. And, and I tell my students, if I hear them going like, I can hear, I have, I, I have ears in the back of my head. Whether it's a pastel stick that's going boom, 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 or a paintbrush that's going tch, tch, tch. You hear people dabbing. They're going over the same thing 10 times and it's not changing or getting better because they don't, they think if they keep putting on, it's gonna get better. So many people don't actually know how to make a beautiful brush stroke or how to mix clean color. And so I sort of come in, I feel like I'm filling in the blanks for people. And maybe they took a workshop a few years ago. I find many people that are so um, intimidated by who's teaching them that they're not necessarily, necessarily honest about what they want to know. They're afraid to ask a question because they don't want to sound stupid. Hmm. Or they think they know less than anybody else or they're the worst person in a workshop. I try not to let that happen because every question is valid. If you have a question and you ask it, you can get the answer. Right. So I really encourage people to put aside egos or any idea of who's better and who's not. We only can paint as well as we can paint. And that comes from us. It doesn't come from the guy next to us. So how do you do a great brush stroke? Give me a brush. <laughs> Sorry, I don't have one with you me. You have to have intention, Eric. You want to have intention of where your brush touches the canvas, how long it stays down there, how you turn it. I personally believe in, that there's a sweet spot in every brush, and I like to hold mine back so that I have the full use of the brush. I don't like to be on top of a painting like this. It's not that I might not. I can't see that close, but... But I think there's a sweet spot to a brush, and I also believe I stand, to me, painting's a full-body experience. I like to use my whole arm. Mm -hmm. I, wanna, I don't want to be limited by anything. I want to be able to make a big brush stroke, a small one. But I also teach something called intentional painting, and that is knowing what you're going to paint, having your concept before you ever start, and thinking. It's something called thinking painting, thinking before you put your paint on. So how if do you If you do thought that? before every stroke, where is this brush going? What color do I want this to be? And you only painted the things that you knew at that moment were right. You'd paint faster and you'd paint better. Well, we tend to get into this mode of almost like sketching. You know, sketching is a continuous movement and, and there's oftentimes this sense of just keep that brush moving, just keep putting paint down when, if you're more deliberate. I remember Richard once told me, as a matter of fact, I think you were there that day, 
Um, Richard said he spent years fixing paintings because he had laid the brush stroke down in the wrong place or his drawing was off yeah. or he didn't have it right. So now he, it's really interesting to watch him paint because he spends a tremendous amount of time mixing his color. Sometimes I've watched him, and I know you work with him on a regular basis, but I've, I've watched him mix color for two or three minutes, which is probably cathartic, right? He's probably thinking about the color and he's thinking about the brush stroke. And then he'll look at it and he'll get his palette knife or his brush and he'll just lay it down perfectly. And it seems like a slow process, and yet his brush stroke work looks fast. Do you know how many years and paintings have gone into that fast looking brush stroke? Well, how many? I'm not sure. I mean, lots, lots. At least 60 years of painting, if not more. I think he started as a teenager and he's in his 80s, maybe, maybe 65 years. Right. And then amount of paintings he's done, it's thousands. So after thousands of paintings, if you're paying attention to what you're doing, I think you would figure out how to put a brush stroke on. You might not, right. you know, but, but ideally, Richard definitely thinks when he's mixing and he thinks before he puts on that brush stroke, he knows exactly where he wants it to go and what it's gonna do. And that's what I would like people to do. I'd like them to slow down, get it more right the first time, and then be able to move on successfully to the next stroke or the next color. So you are in the Putney Painters. Um, you drive up to Putney, Vermont for the, at the Red Barn. The Village Arts Building. Village Barn. Arts Building. Yeah. Um, which is probably a couple hours from where you live? Two and a half. Two and a half hours. Maybe two and a little more. That, that's a lot of dedication and you do that pretty much every week. When you're it around. was every other week. I used to fly back from Tucson and try and get a couple, couple. if we were having three in a row, I'd stay out for a couple of weeks and come back. A lot of dedication. So what do you think? You know what? I don't think it's dedication. Why wouldn't you? Yeah, right. When you have an opportunity that big in front of you, how can you not do it? Right. So it's yeah, desire. I, I, I've often thought, of, Richard has been very generous with me and has made offers to me to come up and hang out and study and uh, you know a family and five kids or I mean three kids and five of us and you know I have my excuses There's probably bad excuses and one day I'll look back and say why didn't I do that what do you think are the most important lessons that he has imparted on you I gotta tell you one of the most wonderful things he's ever said is that before he starts a painting he thinks the word success so he goes into it with the idea that it's going to work. So many people approach a painting with, uh-oh, I don't know if I can do this. I've personally done that, trust me. A lot of times I go, oh my God, I don't know if I can do this. But when you think positively before you ever start, when you're standing in front of that canvas, I think you get back what you put out there. I think if you go in there positively and thoughtfully, you're much more likely to get out what you want instead of throwing yourself at it. And there are times to throw yourself at it. I mean, plein air, when you've got an hour and a half or two hours of light, you've got to get in there and do it. But, but that's a different thing from studio painting. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that, that, that it's not enthusiastic. I mean, I can get really charged up and excited and my adrenaline's rushing before I start a painting. But I'm thinking about it before I'm starting it. I have something I want from that painting. Richard, you know, his kindnesses, his, his talking, his explaining, his thought process. You know, you talk about color and brush strokes and his philosophies are just, they've been very valuable and inspiring. I think the biggest thing about Richard is just an inspiration. You talked about plein air. Um, I love plein air to our audience who may have never experienced it, what's your best pitch for plein air painting? Plein air, by the way, for those of you who don't know, is basically a French term which means outdoors. And so plein air painting has been, it's actually a term that was given to the Impressionists. Yeah. And uh, it was originally derogatory. Really? The, I didn't yeah, know so, that. 
Yeah, there was an article about the Monet, uh, the Monet and uh, the Impressionist exhibit, and the um, I can't remember the name of the guy that wrote the article, but he referred to him as these plein air painters in a derogatory sense, but it stuck. Now there has been, there is evidence of the word being used way before that. So, anyway, what's your best pitch for plein air painting? As far as getting started or just Well, why do it? it? Why do it at all? It's so much easier to stay in the studio. This coming from the publisher of Plein Air magazine. So <laughs> Should I answer this? I want to hear what you have to say. Okay. I was a Plein Air for, obviously I started out in the studio, but then I personally didn't really have a studio. I had kids. I had that whole thing. And so to be able to get away and go paint was was everything. Now... I don't even know if I thought it was plein air at the time, but there's something about, for me, about getting outside in nature. And, and right now I'm specifically going back to a moment where I lived in Florida for a while and I lived in Naples and I used to go out on the beach, you know, at the crack of dawn or at 6.30 or 7 or something when the sand was real cool under my feet and paint the sunrises. Not the sunrise so much, but the color... The color that the water turns, the light at that time of day, is so beautiful. And I've been in love with water ever since, but the feeling of like the cool sand under my feet, because I had to take my shoes off in the sand, and the coolness in the air, and the color of the light, plein air to me, I have goosebumps right now. Plein air to me is a full body experience. It's, it's, I am seriously having chills. <laughs> it's, um, it's you and nature together. And everything is a factor, whether you're standing in the rain, whether it's a cloudy day, whether it's midday sun and you want some shade. All those elements are affecting how you see, how you feel, and what you're painting. It's, it's, it's a real setup. I mean, it's, there's nothing artificial about it. So, and I paint by natural light in my studio. So I, I've never gotten over that feeling of natural light. It's, it just makes me sigh. You know, I love it. I have a real hard time with electric light. Nothing wrong with it. It's just never been what's made me sing. And so that whole plein air light is part of, and natural light is part of what I use in my, in my still lifes inside. Tucson chased me inside or I probably never would have come in. But I just think the way the air smells, the way it feels... All that, and, and that I'm an adrenaline junkie. There is nothing I like better than put me outside and know I've only got a little while to do it. It's fresh, it's direct. Some of them work, some of them they don't, but you don't really have time to think about it. You have to, that's a going for it time. Having said that, I'm really thoughtful about where I'm setting up, and I, and I think about it before I start. I have to get just the right place when I'm out there. If I have to move two inches, <laughs> two inches, but it has to be just right. All right. So do you, uh, most of the studio paintings come from plein air studies? No. No? But they come from life. They come from life. I have done a few plein air studies and made them into studio paintings. Usually they're commissions. My reaction is so immediate when I'm actually in front of something. I can go back into the studio and tweak a painting but I haven't yet learned how to get the feeling that I have in my plein air study into another canvas. I think I'm missing something there, and I probably should. But it's so exciting when you're out there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you factor things that you learn out there. or Maybe there's something I see that I like that I want to take into something else. But chances are I'll find a different situ situation to paint it in. Do you ever paint from photographs? Not really. Because? Nothing wrong with it. All right. Okay. First of all, if I'm going to paint from a photograph, it's, I'm probably going to have started something plein air. Um, you know, I, t I tell my students if they're going to use a photograph, it has to be one that you took because the darks are too dark, the lights are too light, it's not real, and I can tell pretty easily when someone has worked just from a photograph because of the contrast. But, but again, it's who I am. I have... Um, I did a painting, I was actually in France a few years ago, and I painted this um, 
was it might have been a monastery. I'm not sure what it was, but it was probably part of a monastery, and it was a it had a round building and the old tile roofs and I painted all these red flowers growing over it. And she sold it like that. And she said, can't you paint another one of those? And I said, I don't think so. Because I don't do my things twice, you know. But she bugged me for a long time. I thought, well, maybe if I have the photo, I can do another one. It'll be different, but it'll be the same subject matter. So I went and looked in the photo. I don't know where I got those flowers. <laughs> there were like, I just had them bursting over everything. And I looked at the photo, and there were a few red flowers. But when I was out there... They were larger than life. Right. So I saw things so differently. And the funny thing for me is I'll be out, and of course we all have phones now, so it's easy to, if you're painting out any, outside, you take a picture of what you're painting. I come back in and I think I must be a split personality or crazy. My painting doesn't look anything like the photograph. So I haven't, I'm not real good at that. Can it be done? Yes. I have, I have so many photos on my phone and painting startings, I think I'm going to go back and use it. And I can't say that I... Never do, but I actually now have a monitor set up if I'm going to do that because it needs to be larger than life for me. Well, and it, 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 something about a photograph, um, you know, you can be standing in front of a mountain and you can feel the, the ominous sense of that mountain. Right. And you take a photograph of it and it looks like it's, you know, this big and far, far away. You don't feel it. So I, I, I just recently this year got a monitor and... I've tried, I have reference photos I've put up. I'm not, you know, they've been for florals or maybe a Venice scene or something, but but, I, but I'm not going to copy the flower in it, but I want to see maybe what was happening with the light. I can tell you this much, the lights are all too light in them and the darks are all too dark. So it wouldn't work for me to paint from that anyway, but I'm, you know, I'll be looking for a shape or an edge or something to see if I can find it in there if I'm stuck in the painting or... I just put one up that I started last summer to try and find the inspiration. It's so funny. I started out knowing me and how I paint things that don't look like anything else. I, I put this image up on my monitor and I kept thinking, where on earth did I get this painting out of that image? And I had to actually think back to where I was when I painted it. And I know this painting really well because I was actually in Rome at the time and um, the restaurant or bar in Nice or something had just been blown up and I was so affected by it. And I remember thinking, you know, while I'm trying to paint while I'm feeling the emotions about the insensitivity and the insanity of what was going on out there, I was thinking of this painting. So I actually went, I figured out what the date was when that was happening. And I actually went through my phone by the dates and ended up finding the photos I took of this setup that were not the one that I thought I'd painted from. I just, I mean, I had to really like backtrack to figure it out because I know myself. I may set something up, but it doesn't look anything like it to some extent. It does in other ways, of course, but I'm not good at that stuff. So what is your... Um your best advice for somebody who's kind of at the early stage of painting or maybe even trying to get to another level. You do a lot of workshops, you do a lot of teaching. You mentioned to me that you like to go back to the same places because that way you, you can see the progress of the students and continue to work with them. You, we, you, t you talked about brush strokes, but what are the other things that you see that you think are really important for people to, to grasp or understand that would help the viewers of this really get a feel for what they should be focusing on or how they can grow? I think those basics, aside from how you use your materials, and I have to say, you need to buy the best materials you can. Because I see people come in who actually do a decent painting, but it's on a really poor canvas and they don't have a chance because the canvas is getting in the way. Well, why does that make a difference? Because and how, how do they know if it's a good canvas or a poor canvas? Well, you know, you learn that from talking to other people, but also by trying. I think people should step up and not just think because they're a begin be beginner, they have to buy the least expensive thing in the store. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with any of these materials. It's just, it's harder. You are Some, saying there's something wrong okay, with these well, materials. I, certain types of 
really bumpy cotton duck yeah. with a cotton gesso, your brush doesn't slide over it. Right. It, it, you know, you don't want to do a portrait on that unless you're using really heavy paint. Then you have to know how to use really heavy paint. <clears throat> In canvas, you're looking for something with a lot of tooth to it? No. No, the opposite. But you can. To me, the surface needs to be able to have your brush slide. If you're going to use a surface that you don't want to use a lot of paint, if you want to paint more thinly or um, glaze or something, I think you need a smoother canvas. I think the rougher canvases work better if you're using a lot of paint because your brush has to be able to move over that surface. So do you oil down the surface before you paint on it? I use an oil prime canvas. And I did use lead for a while, but now I'm using a quadruple oil prime. Now talk about paint because that's also a pretty common mistake of beginners is they, they go for cheap paint. Why does that make a difference? You know, I don't know that cheap paint is even as important as having good brushes. I think you can paint with almost anything. Your most beautiful colors you're not going to get out of the student grade paint probably, but I think you can paint. I think the paint is less important. I think the brushes are huge. Brushes so that they hold the amount of paint that you want them to. So do you load up? Are your brush strokes pretty thick? Some of them are and some of them aren't. Right. But I decide where I want the thick paint and where I want the thin paint. Right. And then I have brushes that will do that for me. Mm -hmm. And well, my like brushes, I mean, I, they're like, you know, my dad is violinist. He always traveled with his violin. I travel with my brushes. They are always in my carry-on. I could replace canvas, I could replace paint, but I cannot replace my brushes. And I definitely have ones I get used to, and I know what they do, and... They're your tools. I'd rather you take everything I've got with me than my brushes, <laughs> you know? I can get more clothes, and you can get another bottle of water, but I can't get the same brushes. Right, because they've worn to a certain way, or... Or they're, you... I like them, I know what they are, they work for me, they're my tools. Right. Okay. Did I answer your question? No. <laughs> okay, what was it? <laughs> what, what do I want people to know? I think study. Okay, I think it's important to find someone whose work you like that inspires you. It could be subject matter, it could be the way they're painting, you know, it could be flowers, it could be portraits, it could be landscape, but find someone whose paintings speak to you. And then go to a class get a DVD. Um, I also think pe painting with other people is great because we all keep each other honest. Well, we, you know, there's this, there's this uh, workshop junkie mentality of hopping from one workshop to another workshop to another workshop and, and, and kind of in a very short period of time learning a lot of different approaches and st studying under a lot of different people. Is that harmful? Is that a good I thing? I think that's just, that's just personal choice. I mean, you know, Scottsdale or even Vermont, people go to Scottsdale for a month and maybe they're from Michigan. And there's a different great person four weeks in a row in Scottsdale, so they try and do all of them because when are they going to get to them again? Right. Or people come to Vermont and it's out of the way, so they'll do two or three back to back or with a week in between. I, th I think part of it is just logistics. Is that Bennington, Vermont? Where do, no, where? Putney. Putney, oh. Because we hold workshops at the Village Arts Barn. Oh, okay. So someone might come and take mine and Kathy's and Michelle Dunaway, whoever. But they'll come because there are, I, have a, I have a student that comes from Italy and comes to the barn. He's going to take me, he'll take Michelle, he took um, I think he's going to take Mark Bogus. But he'll be over here from Italy, so he wants to get as much in as he can. Sure. There's so many different ways to approach this. I think it can be confusing for a beginner to do that. I, I think if you're just starting out, it's maybe better to find one person or find a class you can go to on a regular basis as you get started. But, you know, there are people I'd love to study with. Well, being in this uh, video uh, arena and working with artists on a regular basis. One of the one of the great 
um, opportunities and dangers for someone like me is that I fall in love with what they do and then I switch right. my palette right. and then three weeks later I'm at another shoot and then I switch my palette again and, <clears throat> and so you can be constantly chasing that and I finally had to say to myself I have to stabilize because yeah. every time you add one color to your palette it changes all your everything it changes your your color charts it changes everything so you you know in my case I had to finally stabilize but yet I like there's so many things that you can learn from so many different people right do you take a little bit that reaches you or means something and then you apply it in your own way I actually people want a supplies list when they come into my workshop but I actually tell them bring what you're used to I mean yes you can use my palette but one of the things I find tough for students in workshops is, yeah, they come in with a completely different palette. And I used to do the same thing. I'd go buy out and buy all new paints for, um, like I did a David LaFell workshop years ago in Taos, and I went and bought all new paints and new colors. And um, you pull yourself out of your comfort zone, and then you're trying to work with whole new palette of colors. And how can you do everything at one time? I'd rather my students keep the paints that they've got. If they want to add one or two things, great. But good brushes. But I, I, they need to have some comfort level in order to be able to absorb more. Right. You know, if you know approximately what your colors are going to do, then you can pay attention to your values or your edges or your shapes. And those are the basic things you have to know. Values, edges, shapes. Um, color. I mean, values are values are big things with beginners, being able to, the squint down is important to me, but being able to simplify and then it going into the shapes and the color. If you're trying to struggle with everything new at one time, how can you do it? Your brain isn't free to listen and learn. You're too busy trying to figure out this stuff. Do you do value studies or do you ask your students to do value studies? You're painting with basically a black and white or brown and white? Depending on the situation, yes. Yeah. You have mentioned, while we've been talking today, you mentioned you lived in Tucson, in Florida. Um, you said something about painting in, I think you said painting in Venice. You, you, you move around a lot. Are, is the FBI chasing you? Yeah, no. I think, I just love I love travel. I love the excitement. I have to say this, so I am drawn by where I'm going to paint. Like, I probably won't go somewhere if I can't paint there. Mm -hmm. But I just get a lot of great opportunities, and I grab my stuff and go. And I've been, I've been lucky. I mean, growing up, I knew I wanted to go to Europe to study art. So I landed in London for five years, and I traveled all over from there. And then just my life, I've been so lucky and grateful to people I've met and opportunities that have presented themselves that I've been able to continue the traveling. I want to ask you a completely different question. You, you raised um, four kids. I did. And yet you managed to juggle a career. Because you talked about somebody who who had been in one of your classes and had, you know, kind of put their painting on hold and they had the passion but they just couldn't do it because they had this life with kids or whatever. What would you say to somebody who's going through that, who maybe has this desire to paint? How, you know, how did you do it? What what could you teach us about what you went through? Because you managed to paint, you managed to continue to your career and you were also a mom and a wife how did you deal with all that i think you learn to grab it as you can when i had one child i used to paint in the kitchen when i could um, when it became more than that i would draw take a sketchbook with me paint when i could i mean somehow i always found a way to uh get a little time. Not every day. It doesn't have to be every day, but I really feel that, first of all, once you decide that you want to be an artist and you want to paint or sculpt or draw 
any of the, any of the two-dimensional, your vision changes. You realize that when you look at color, the shadow on the snow has blue in it. And there's like this, this vision miracle that happens to us. Once we start mixing our own colors, or if you've ever sculpted and then you start to look at people's heads, you can't help yourself, you're analyzing all the time. I don't think you ever lose that. I feel that I did go years without painting, but I feel like I grew in those years because I was still observing. And I was still looking at other people's paintings, whether it was in a gallery or in a museum. You never stop learning. Because I think your mind starts to analyze and digest. And then when you can go back to it, full time, I mean, of course, I drew my kids at times, did some horrible paintings of them, you know. Did some nice pastels of my daughter when she was little on the beach. But you don't lose that. Again, I think it's a part of us. And if we honor it, it doesn't go away. And so, okay, so you have to take off from it for 10 or 15 or even 20 years. It doesn't mean it's not still there. It just means that you're so grateful when you get this opportunity that to me you learn that much faster. Because then you're really driven and you want it now. So, last question. Maybe. Maybe. Best total piece of advice for somebody who's pursuing painting? As Nike would say, do it. I mean it, you just have to do it. Eric, you can't let anything get in your way, you just have to do it. Whenever you can, as much as you can, and as conscious as you can. Thank you. You're welcome. This has been wonderful. I enjoyed it. Those lemons really look realistic to me. She's so good at it. That was Stephanie Birdsall. The video is called Lemons and Leaves, and you can learn more about it at lilyartvideo.com. I'm Eric Rhodes. Remember, take advantage of this time and learn something new. Grow as an artist. We'll see you. The finest homes and the best museums are filled with still life paintings. No matter what inspires you to paint, the still life is a great way to grow as a painter by gathering interesting items or fruits or plants to paint from life. Not only does painting a still life help you master light, perspective, and color in a whole new way, the more you do it, the more you'll be able to understand the world around you. With master artist Stephanie Birdsall, learning to paint great still lifes is a shortcut to becoming a fearless painter. Now, in this all-new video course, she will show you how to create a stunning still life painting, from setting up the scene to make a beautiful composition, to making the final brushstrokes, all using one of her favorite subjects, the lemon. Hi, I'm Stephanie Birdsall. I've just finished filming a new instructional DVD. My subject matter is lemons and leaves because I love lemons and leaves. Then I'll walk you through my process of setting up, how I tweak my still life, the problems I run into, the thoughts I have, how I paint, how I walk my way through my painting, and I look forward to sharing it with you. It's been a great experience. In Lemons and Leaves, The Natural Still Life, you'll discover why it's important to create a happy marriage between the objects in your painting and how to make it happen. The steps for figuring out what's wrong when your painting feels off and what to do when you figure it out. Plus, how to create a painting that feels rich and museum quality, something few painters have ever figured out on their own. This master course in painting gives you almost eight hours of in-depth training that you can return to time and time again. Stephanie Birdsall is in demand by both collectors and serious students alike. And in this training, she'll teach you the exact techniques you can begin using today to paint your own stunning still life compositions. Lemons and Leaves, The Natural Still Life with Stephanie Birdsall is now available on DVD and streaming video.